And we're live. Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another installment in the Summer of Nix public, no, sorry. Summer of Nix 2022 public lecture series. There we go. Um, today we'll have John Ringer talk about Nix packages actually. And uh, a lot of things around Nix packages. And I hope you guys are by now familiar with the format of the lecture series. Uh, meaning that for a continued discussion after or even during the talk, uh, there's the Matrix channel, so head over to there if you have any questions. Also, do not be afraid to post your questions in the Oncas instance, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter. And yeah, again, I want to make sure to thank the people that made all of this happen, which is the NLNet Foundation, European Commission, the Next West Foundation, and Tweak, of course. So I hope you all have a wonderful lecture and... I do hope you all enjoy it. So I will be giving the stage to John. So please all welcome John and let's see what he has to say. Brian, uh, yes, my name is Jonathan Ringer and uh, today I'm gonna to talk about Nix packages. And within this talk, I'll do kind of what is Nix packages, a brief history of Nix packages, <clears throat> some of the unique qualities of Nix packages as compared to a lot of other package repositories. And um, also in that vein, the many ways in which Nix packages can be leveraged, uh, even in like non-traditional domains, uh, the release process that we have for Nix packages, uh, a little bit about maintainership, and then also how to contribute. So to begin this talk, why should you care about what I have to say? Um, I've been programming for almost 10 years now. Uh, I first stumbled upon Nix in around 2017 through a Haskell subreddit. Uh, began trying it in early 2019. First contribution was May that year. Then I got my commit bit September. I became addicted to using Nix. Uh, I got really enthralled with its designs, its elegance. And uh, yeah, to try to learn how to use Nix, I just started reviewing PRs. So uh, <laughs> that's how I got started with the community. Um, and then also, uh, the next year I became the release manager. So the 2009 release, uh, which was with uh, World of Peace and then later on Solo 2105 and then uh, 2111 with Tim DeHera and uh, Tom Barrick. Um, and then I'm still involved today. So currently I'm over 70,000 con contributions and uh, going to go strong. Um, and this isn't to tout my own horn. This is more or less to say that in the past three and a half years, Nix has been a huge part of my life and uh, really happy to contribute and be part of the, the community. And so then let's start with a brief history about Nix. Uh, Nix was started as a PhD thesis by uh, Alko Dostra. Um, this began in 2003. Originally, it was an uh, SVN code repository. Uh, eventually, it moved to Git. I, I couldn't find the year. Uh, but then the community moved to GitHub in 2012. Uh, Nixos used to be a separate code repository altogether that lived outside of Nix packages. But in 2013, it was merged. And that's now the Nixos directory inside of the repository. We also had the first release of Nixos that year. And then, uh, the, at least from my own personal observations, this is a rough estimate, but it seems like every two years, activity on uh, these packages has been uh, about doubling. And that, that's a huge growth rate. And I'm really uh, excited to see that continue to grow. But what is Nix packages? And so these are kind of the figures that we would normally see when we're kind of touting uh, or like sh uh, shilling Nix packages. And it, it does have all these features. So it's a massive package or repository that's all source-based. Uh, we have roughly 60 to 80,000, depending on how you count that. And then um, it's also the home of Nix OS. And um, also too, like uh, the the amount of activity on that is very impressive. So we have about like a hundred merge PRs a day, uh, about a hundred commits, and then also like 10, 10 issues uh, a day. So uh, extend that to a month, like it's very, very active there. Um, and it's, it's like a very vibrant community. Um, but qualitatively, and this is what really excites me about mixed packages is uh, that it is so much more than just a repository of packages. It's also multi-platform, so you can run it on any distro. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, you can run it on macOS, uh, and then there's uh, some experimental support for other platforms as well, like FreeSD. FreeBSD, but your mileage will vary <laughs> a lot. Um, and then the as a personal user of it, I really like that Nix packages isn't just a static collection of configurations and state. Um, so think of something like uh, Apt or Debian, uh, where 
that's kind of just this metadata repository where there's these artifacts that you eventually fetch. And the creation of those artifacts is very separate from the maintenance of those artifacts. And so then as a user of Nix packages, I'm able to use stuff like overlays and overwriting to kind of shape that landscape to something that I would actually really want to consume and then extend forward in my use cases. Um, the one way that I like to conceptualize this is that each one of these little packages are, are like a small island of context in, uh, included software. So if I have something like Firefox and I use the Firefox package from Nix packages, uh, everything that it needs to run at runtime uh, can kind of be bundled with it. And it's this like nice minimal, uh, what we call closure uh, needed uh, to then actually run that software. And then the last little bit is that it's just a body of code. Uh, there's nothing super special about Nix packages. It's highly regular. It's just Nix code. And now it has all the benefits of code. Uh, so you can version control it. Uh, you can iterate on it. You can do PR workflows. You can do CI workflows. Uh, it's very, very beautiful. And um, how, how is Nix able to kind of achieve this uniqueness? Well, it's kind of how we abstract over a package. And so each package within Nix packages, um, technically we have three different types of der uh, derivations, but the most common one that you'll see is called an input address derivation. And that means that these packages are unique based upon the sources that are included in them, the uh, uh, build and runtime dependencies that they have, the build steps, architecture and platform. All of this is factored into a very unique package that's uh, separate from everything else. You can think of it almost like a UID. Um, and so there's like a way to uniquely identify a package exactly how you intended to use it. Um, and so then down at the bottom, I just have a quick little example where if you remove an optional dependency, then it gets reflected in how Nix will address that package. Um, if you're familiar with the a concept of Merkle trees, uh, you can think of the hash there as the, Mer the, like the Merkle tree hash. Uh, and that would be a relatively correct intuition. Um, and the thing though, is that I mentioned earlier where it's source-based, but we have this way to uniquely identify things. And so Nix lives on both spectrums of this source versus binary distribution of a package manager. On the one hand, you have something like Gentoo, which uh, they do have support for downloading some binaries uh, now. So it's not completely source-based if you opt into the binary workflow. But uh, historically, people kind of uh, associate Gentoo with you build everything on your machine, you use some use flags, so you have some way to kind of compose a environment that suits your needs better for you. Um, and, but the thing though is that it's incredibly slow to build everything. And so then a lot of times package managers like apps, RPM, uh, they get the leg up because for a user experience, it's really fast to just download pre-built binaries. And that's like a good user experience. Um, and then Recently, uh, like recently, like 10 years ago, uh, Docker kind of came onto the, the playing field. And now you have this like environment plus an application. Uh, and then you have other kind of technologies that are built or like kind of using that containerization technology, but some metadata to then have a package like experience. And so that would be things like Flatpak and Snaps. Um, but Nix, Nix doesn't cleanly fit anywhere on there. Uh, on the one hand, you can just disable substitutors altogether, and now you have the Gen 2 workflow. Um, but then if you only consume things from next packages, essentially you only have the binary workflow. And so it's kind of this nice little foot in both realms. And um, because we have the, uh, because Nix and Nix packages has these like very descriptive ways to describe exactly what goes into a package, we, we essentially don't have to worry about stepping on other packages' feet. And um, it also kind of enables all these other beautiful things that kind of fall out of being able to uniquely identify a given package. And how does Nix go about creating these very unique packages? Well, it's in, it's in two ways. Um, and in, in this is that all things that Nix ever builds falls these two steps. So one would be instantiation. This would, if you ever look up how to like write a package, uh, generally they'll call it a Nix expression, but instantiation is taking that that code, that expression, and then kind of creating an intermediate build workflow. And so we call this a derivation where uh, things like your platform and architecture get resolved and all of your dependencies. And so then after instantiation, Nix has a very clear cut way to exactly 
uh, build whatever piece of software that you want. Um, and then the second step would be realization. This is the actual build part that we think in a traditional sense. And so we go from that like build recipe into that realized store path or, or the package that you want to consume. Um, and one thing to note that's unique about Nix packages, um, maybe not unique anymore uh, with stuff like Silver Blue, but uh, what, what is uh, unique about it though is that all these paths are now read only after building. And what that enables is also something called maximal sharing. So if you have package A and package B and they both rely on the exact derivation of package C, uh, they can freely share that without having to worry about the other ever mutating it. And uh, so we get very, uh, pretty much 100% like dependency reuse across the landscape if they just happen to use something by accident. Uh, there's no, and it like organically falls out of um, being able to uniquely identify everything. Um, but where does this all get stored? Uh, so in a traditional uh, operating system, you would have stuff like the bin directory, lib directory, user directory, and all of these resources, dependencies, binaries, libraries, uh, all of these things would kind of have to cohabitate with each other and you could really only have one version of each other. But uh, the one thing that Nix does is kind of separates those concerns. So you can think of packages uh, existing independently of what is on your system. So the nice thing is that you don't have to be stuck in some invalid state. Um, and what I mean by that is that let's say you updated like OpenSSL and then you just break a bunch of stuff later on when you go to try to run it. Uh, that I would consider your system to be an invalid state. In Nix packages, uh, trying to do that, you would like redefine the entire history of how to build something and then it would try to build something new. Uh, the build and development environments uh, that you would use with Nix contain only what they need. Um, so for example, we have a very common tool with the Nix package called Nix Shell. And you can just instantiate Nix Shell. It will modify your path, modify certain environment variables to communicate what should be present in there. But uh, in the end, what you get is just exactly what you needed. And once you leave, it's like it never existed. Um, it does exist in the next store, it's just not exposed in any way. And I guess conceptually, this is one thing that I think is very different about Nix packages as well, is that many people, when they come from a more traditional um, like RPM or apps environment, they always want to talk about how do I install something? And I think that's kind of the wrong way to view Nix. What you really want to view Nix as is how do I expose the packages and dependencies uh, in the environment in which I wanted it. So for Nix OS, that would be your system. How do I expose it at the system level? But then if I were to do development, then like how do I expose it uh, for my development workflow? And then if I were to build a Nix package, how do I ex uh, expose it in the build environment? Um, and I think those are all separate concerns, but that that's kind of like the main uh, perspective difference that I think is, is, is different there. Um, yes. And so then extending Nix packages beyond just packages, um, like I mentioned earlier, the little islands of software. Well, it's really nice to have some way to make it into something bigger than the parts uh, that they, they they are. So in this way, Nixos uh, kind of inverts the logic, whereas Nix packages were only concerned about a uh, what's the minimal uh, amount of dependencies that I need to run a piece of software. Now Nixos is saying, it's still like, what's the minimal thing to achieve this goal? But it's the, how can I combine and compose all of this software and configuration into something that is greater? And so um, I mentioned how we do the instantiation and realization. Well, that's just arbitrary uh, that we would do it mostly for software packages, but you can also do things like configuration or systemd units. And so you're able to kind of freely use that derivation model to also build up larger abstractions. And in this case, it would be like services. Uh, so like if I wanted to do services.postgres, uh, then I can build up all my database configuration alongside of the actual software that I'm going to use, along with any other kind of uh, runtime dependencies that I would also need. And uh, one interesting aspect about Nixos modules is that uh, we use something called fixed point um, logic to kind of deduce what the final state of the system is. So from the module year, uh, itself, you're kind of able to inspect 
the entirety of the other system as it would be if I were to consume it in its end state. And then when, from the specific module, you can kind of just do your n plus one mod, uh, logic. And what I mean by that is that like the Postgres module is only concerned about setting up Postgres services and it can kind of view everything else, but it's not concerned with that. And I think that's a really beautiful scalable model for complexity. Whereas in traditional workflows where you have something like Ansible and stuff like that, where you're doing a series of actions to achieve a certain end state, it's really kind of like you have to mentally keep track of all of those effects and how they propagate across the system and how it mutates certain things. Whereas with Nix, you kind of just declare it, you say, I want this to exist and it exists. And um, for the way to extend and modify your configuration, if you ever use stuff like make force, make order, make, uh, make merge, uh, you have all these nice little rich primitives to then overwrite kind of the de default behavior that Nixos is kind of opinionated about. You get uh, like Nixos will give you the defaults like, hey, this is what I think it should be. But if you do, if you are more opinionated, for example, if you have a hardened system, you can just say, hey, my open TCP ports, make force only like SSH. Uh, or maybe just open SSH on a different port if you don't want to be constantly scanned. Uh, and then uh, that's it. Uh, you can just override any other type of settings and you're free to do that. Uh, one thing that this also allows for, and this is probably the most um, recognized aspect of Nixos, is that you're able to define your system within a single configuration file. And so then on the right hand side, I have like this very minimal amount of declarative syntax where it's like, hey, I would like open SSH to be enabled. And also I want Docker to be enabled. And from there, all of the other modules that may be concerned about those options are able to react accordingly. And then the open SSH module themselves are able to do stuff like ensure that there's a open SS, uh, SSHD uh, daemon running and that the ports are open. And it's, it's very beautiful. Um, and the other thing too, uh, I mentioned earlier where Nix doesn't really have a uh, like a system. So there's the, that divide between the system and the packages. And so then what this allows for is something called generations. So each time we build a system configuration, we can just say a generation. And then uh, because you're kind of only manifesting that environment when you need it, uh, you can go uh, back and forth through history. And so uh, we call this rolling back, uh, but you're kind of able to select this timeline of uh, modifications that you do. And that's that's a very unique aspect as well. Uh, a lot of people today, they'll do something like ButterFS and snapshots, but you have to capture everything about your system. Uh, and that can be very, very large. Whereas with the Nix, you get this nice little beautiful uh, minimal configuration file. And the only thing that you would really want to snapshot is your mutable persistent data. So your databases, your libraries, things of those nature. Um, Nix packages can also be extended to all, doing user configuration. So there's another tool that I would highly recommend people to look into if they're trying to get uh, started with Nix. And this is called Home Manager. But Home Manager, I would describe as something like Nixos Lite, uh, so, or Nixos for the user. And uh, what, um, what this means is that you can think of it more as like your dot files, your user programs, uh, like a lot of people, uh, we'll have these like very intensive install scripts that are kind of like, if I'm not in this state, then I need to get to a state by doing these actions. Uh, so, so that's kind of like a reconciliation configuration uh, management. But with uh, Home Manager, it's like the congruent model. So what I describe on the input side is what I'm going to get on the output side. Um, and the other nice thing about Home Manager is that because it doesn't have a intuition about system services or hardware, uh, it can also be extended across more than just Nix OS. So for example, I use my home manager configuration for Mac OS. Um, I used to use it for WSL and then like my three other machines. And I essentially have like the same home across multiple devices and it's very beautiful. And then on the right-hand side, I have something where it's just kind of like, I'm very particular about how my Git configuration is and I'm able to encode that in a nice declarative minimal syntax. Um, can we extend this model further, though? Um, within Nix packages, we do also Nixos tests. And what they are is just like these multi-node, multi-service uh, workflows where you can bring up these independent actors, and then you can kind of assert some workflow. And 
Uh, trying to do this in a traditional context, let's say you're a SaaS provider and you want to spin up a, a SaaS scenario where you spin up your service and then some user workflow, it's actually very difficult to uh, achieve this. And generally it's very much like hacked on and then like hope that things are in place and then try to do the workflow and hope to God that your test cases match <laughs> like the behavior that was intended. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's very beautiful. And then on the remote side, so if you're if you're trying to do something where you're reasoning about multiple machines, there's there's many things that are available today. So NixOps is the one that's uh, within the Nix ecosystem itself. Um, and then DeployRS, I think was Serial. Don't quote me on that. Um, and then uh, Bitta would be like IOG. But these are used in scenarios where uh, you're talking about mini services and you want to have kind of that high availability or microservice type model. Um, and then my, my personal favorite about Nix uh, is the Nix shell um, tool. And here, this is like, if you need to try a package, like you need a different Go compiler version, then you can just Nix shell that into environment. Uh, and then you can use it. And when you're done using it, you can get out of that shell. And once you're out of that shell, it's like it never existed. Uh, if people are familiar with Python's virtual environment, uh, I think of that as like a virtual env, but like for your system. And so like you can do it for native dependencies, build dependencies, libraries, whatever. Um, you can bring them in, use them, discard them, move on with your life. Uh, and you don't have to acquire all this cumulative debt of doing apt install, homebrew install. Yeah. Um, but this is um, that's kind of how Nix is leveraged. but. Uh, like how how does how does it actually work underneath the covers? Because within Nix packages, um, like there's all this work to be done. I mentioned early on, there's like all this activity, but like how do how do people actually receive that? And so then um, the development on Nixos Nix packages is just a code related workflow. So it's just a GitHub repository. We do PRs, we do issues, uh, etc. For this, but uh, what that manifests into is that like if I wanted to update my individual package, that's just a PR send up there. Uh, someone will review it, uh, hopefully, <laughs> and then uh, merge it. Uh, and this also includes stuff like fixes, security patches, uh, enhancements to existing services and modules, and then also backporting from the, the development branch, which is master, to the release branch at the time. Um, but uh, that's just how we collect all of that activity. Uh, the one that actually distributes that to the end users uh, for binary downloads is Hydra. So Hydra is a very Nix specific CI CD tool. Um, since Nix is so different than other traditional, uh, I don't know, package managers or like CI CD workflows, uh, like Hydra is the one that's like understands the Nix workflow and is able to translate that and leverage that to its, to its, um, to its benefit. So uh, the official uh, Hydra instance is hydra.nixus.org. And uh, you can see that it, the, the amount of builds that it does is pretty astounding. And I think like for Trunk right now, which is a holdover from the SVN days. Uh, <laughs> um, but on Trunk right now, I think it's building like 140,000 packages or something like that each time uh, we have a, an update or somebody pull from master. So it's, it's, a, it's pretty, pretty amazing how much it's able to do. Um, and how the release workflow is, is that uh, if you ever try to install Nix packages or use Nix channel or use Flakes, generally people will say like, oh, use like Nixos Unstable if you want Unstable or Nixos uh, 2205 would be the latest stable. And <clears throat> those are release channels. And Hydra is actually the one that's pushing those updates. And Hydra, what it does is once it pulls master, then there will also be a description of what to build. Um, so like a uh, Nixos release.nix or something like that. Uh, and in there, it will say like, hey, if all of these things pass, uh, and this is kind of the, the CI workflow or the continuous integration, like if all these gates pass, then we're able to uh, go forward with incrementing the release channel, and then we can release that to the public. And that's um, that's it, actually. <laughs> um, the other kind of interesting thing about Hydra, though, is that the updating of the cache is actually done asynchronously from release channels. And so what I mean by that is that anytime Hydra has a successful build of a package, regardless of how uh, it came to be, uh, it will just be automatically update, uh, uploaded to the cache. And this model works well because I mentioned the we can uniquely describe how packages exist. Uh, well, 
if you wanted to consume from that cache, you just need to also describe the exact package that you wanted. Um, and so then the cache can be thought of like a key value store of, if it exists, please give it to me. If it doesn't exist, then I'll go down the, the tree to see what you do and don't have, and then I'll build the rest. Um, and next is kind of just ways to contribute to Nix packages. Um, there's a, there's a lot, a lot of ways to contribute. Uh, it's in, you can think of Nix packages, its scope is trying to do all software in existence. So there's a lot of a lot of domain in there. And we have a lot of packages, and a lot of packages have a lot of different workflows. So um, yes, if, if you're using Nix packages, please, please submit issues. Uh, a lot of times what happens is that someone will package something, it gets updated. That person that first packaged it no longer uses it daily. And so then um, maybe some update, uh, update invalidated workflow. And we're just not aware of that because it builds fine, it looks fine. Uh, maybe the test suite runs fine, but uh, there's nothing to indicate at runtime that it's actually not in a great state. Um, and so then that's just one example. Uh, if you're more comfortable with Nix packages and writing Nix, then please, 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 please uh, do pull requests for fixing broken builds or searching use cases for your software or doing updates. Um, that's, a, that's a great way as well. Uh, Nix packages is kind of in this weird state where uh, a lot of actual large FOSS projects are. Once you get to a certain size of contributions, it's really hard to find reviewers for that. So like the Linux kernel is also in a similar state where it's really hard to find maintainers that can review the patch workload. And yeah, Next package is also in the state where it's like, it's really hard to find enough manpower, uh, person power, uh, to then review all that work. Um, but if you're if you're not wanting to contribute in just code, um, also discussions are great. So we also have uh, discourse and matrix and joining in there also good in terms of both a sense of community as well as if people need help or if you need help. Um, documentation. Uh, this is probably the biggest one that is lacking within the community, but we have I would describe relatively good reference manuals. Uh, but the problem, though, is that not everyone wants to just do reference. Uh, so like system D, for example, is notorious for having great reference documentation. But it's like, how how, how do I write a unifile? And it's <laughs> it's really hard to to find like what you should do. And um, I think Nix is kind of in a similar state where where we, we can work on making it these more um, these, these workflows that people are more likely to actually consume. And then in that vein, Nixos Wiki generally does a good job of doing deep dives on specific topics. Uh, we do have Nix pills, but that's like very technical. Um, that's, that's kind of describing how standard div dot make derivation works, and which I think is good if you're going to do a long-term investment in Nix, but uh, we don't really have anything that's like a nice rose link book. Um, and then the last thing that you can do is become a maintainer. So maintainer, I think, is kind of like a nice compromise between all of these where uh like what does it what does it mean to become a maintainer well today larger what it means is that uh the the packages that you maintain eventually you get notifications whenever they get updated or changed by people and so then you'll just get a little github notification you can go there you can review the work uh we we document uh how you should review a package but um but yeah uh it's immensely beneficial even if you don't have commit rights just to see like Hey, like I'm the maintainer on this package. There's like some work on it. Um, I reviewed it. I certified that like at least in some normal workflow that it works. Like if I'm a uh, able to uh, be a committer and I come across that, like that's a huge win for me. Like ah, oh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, like I, <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't have to be as worried about the correctness of the package if someone who's very familiar with the package says that it's correct. Um, and with that, uh, I think I'll take questions now. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I will also be pulling Matthias in here since he has been posting a lot of questions on Matrix as well. There we go. And I'll do it like that. There we go. So welcome, Matthias. Um, so one of the first questions I saw coming in was over at Matrix. Um, a question by Mighty Ian. Ian, hope I pronounce it. Mighty, right. Mighty Jam. Mighty Jam, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the question is: Do you feel the absence of static types in Next packages? 
Do I feel the absence of static types? I would say on the average, no. But I would say when I do miss them, it hurts bad. So like if I am writing uh, an array of something and I forget to do the little parentheses around some function call, and <laughs> just uh, this item, this item is a function, not a set. Um, yeah, it's it uh, it can bite, and I would really like to see static typing within Nix packages. And uh, the workflow with Nickel kind of gives me uh, hope there. The Nixos module system has like a type system tacked onto it, but it's not as ergonomic as it would be if it was natively included. That makes sense. Um, I think it's best if I let Matthias ask his own questions. Yeah. Um, thanks, John, for the for the great talk. Um, yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, number one is, uh, so Nix packages is this giant uh, mono repo, and then now there's also this approach to um, with flakes have every package in in its own repo basically, and then a search engine could potentially aggregate uh, those different repos. Um, do you see in between those kind of extreme and uh, do, do you see also space for, let's say, having something like two Nix packages, uh, uh, let's say, two big software libraries that could coexist and work together? Or, or what's your, your take on this question? Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. The one thing that I will say in benefit of the mono repo is that a lot of times what will happen is that we'll have stuff like I want to update the Python interpreter, but then like the Apple SDK like has issues or um, like this lib XML or whatever is also causing issues. And um, being able to kind of have a holistic view of everything at once is really enabling for cross package issues. Um, and what I would like to not see is just, if we do go to the Flex model, uh, I think it, it might work for stuff where like the Python package set, uh, like a lot of those packages kind of don't care about the native dependencies on the whole, with the exception maybe of like machine learning um, and learning algebra. But um, the thing though is that like software isn't meant to be just in a vacuum. So especially in the FOSS community, there's so many different libraries and pieces of software. Like it would, I would think it would be really hard to actually shard that, that model into something that's um, more distributed. Um, I, do I think it can work? I think it can. Uh, I think it would just be really difficult in practice. And the maintenance burden of tracking down where those regressions happen would be a lot more difficult. One thing that I do like in Nix packages is you could just do a git bisect on something that if it does break in staging, and then eventually you could just use the git tooling to find where that got uh, where that that workflow got invalidated or or died. Okay, um, then I have uh, another question. Uh, so on Nix packages also has Flakes uh, support um, already, and I think many packages, at least for me, work. Um, you know, what's the state of this? Do you know uh, whether there are things left to be done um, to, to make that fully compat Flakes compatible? Uh, are you talking about like consuming Flakes from Next packages? Or are you saying like consuming? F f uh, that's I, I was just about to word that question in the same exact way, but mean two different things. Uh, do you mean like from Nix packages being able to use other flakes, or do you mean like uh, just making the the flake workflow the standard? Yeah, but I, I basically just mean to type uh, Nix run Nix packages and then whatever package, and then you know it it starts with the uh, with the flakes command line interface. Um, yeah, I would I would defer to Elko, um, and I I. I sympathize with his want to keep it experimental and so that he still is like, oh, hey, as we incur pain with the CLI and its ergonomics, we can change directory, um, change trajectory uh, without kind of like breaking the world. And that I think is still very powerful for someone who just doesn't want to make, who doesn't want to have to do a Nix 4.0 essentially. So I, that I sympathize with, and um, that's that's all I'm going to say on the matter. Uh, like I've been using Flex for a year and a half, and I've had relatively little issues, uh, at least for the 99% of the workflows. 
the the command line experience has been the same. Okay, and then I have a last one. Uh, so when we do um, when we add tests uh, on next packages, um, uh, how far would you typically go with with tests? Would you just kind of test all you can? Uh, or do you think um, we shouldn't add too many tests because then uh, you know we have to maintain these tests as well and change them? Uh, do, do you have an opinion on this? Yeah, I, I do actually. So I would say is that the correctness of the software, that burden ship, uh, or that burden of ownership is on the upstream. So the, it's like the upstream's are responsibility to make sure that it works. Uh, our responsibility is just to make sure of how we package it that works. So I would say tests should be kind of like minimal and complete by doing workflows where um, they kind of push the boundaries of what it's supposed to do, but not do like some exhaustive, massive test suite. Um, it is really annoying when you run a Python machine learning library and then they do their test suite, which is massively compute memory and storage heavy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there's definitely a compromise there. We, we should make sure that it uh, it's more or less correct in the context of Nix. That, that's what we should be asserting most and optimizing for that. OK, nice. Um, there's also a question over on YouTube uh, from Mihai Fuvizan, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, how would you envision a Nix package transition from Nix to Nickel? Uh, I can't speak too intelligently uh, intelligently on that, but uh, if I remember correctly, the the base syntax of Nickel is very similar to Nix. And if if I want to say that they have gradual typing, so uh, if I do see it roll out, either two things: if the syntax is not compatible, then we'll have to just do a full rewrite, uh, which would be very painful. Or if it's something kind of like Python, where they do have gradual typing, and you can just have additional syntax in uh, so in addition to the existing syn syntax, then, then we can have something where you kind of slowly introduce that syntax over time. And I think yeah. I think that would be the preferable route, but there's always pros and cons with this. Uh, like maybe like a, the really nice ergonomic syntax is just not compatible with the current um, parser, uh, the, the uh, what's the word, uh, when you parse uh, the grammar. There we go. Yeah. It's not compatible with that grammar. OK. Um, then over on Matrix, um, we have new Intel, by the way. It's pronounced Mighty I am. Um, so both me and Matthias were wrong last time on the name. Um, but uh, they ask, how do multiple versions of packages work at all? Uh, how do multiple versions of package work at all? Uh, Nix has the separation of build and runtime dependencies. And so then as long as you're never in an environment where those two things need to be coherent, uh, I'll give one example. So uh, bit, like hardware acceleration, if you need them both to reference your video drivers, then that would be one instance where they need a link against something outside of just their closure. But on average, CLI applications, services, anything that doesn't necessarily need like hardware acceleration, um, the, the multiple versions works because Nix only exposes the, the particular dependencies that they need at build time. And if they still exist at runtime, then that's the only thing that goes there. So I'll do one example, like Python 2 versus 3, when that used to be big back in like 2019. Um, you can have one application packaged with Python 2 because when it runs, it's only aware of Python 2. And then if you have another one that's packaged with Python 3, it's only aware of Python 3. So you can have incompatible Python versions, but you can still have usable applications because their runtimes are essentially separated. Um, and if you have something that can compile, then we have other leverages like um, RunPath and uh, RPath, where we can set that to very Nix specific items. So if it, anyway, to, to say it in, uh, in short is that uh, Nix, Nix, Nix allows you to express incompatible packages or different versions. Um, and then as long as you don't have something where like the path, like if you put Python uh, 3.9 and 3.10 on the same path, then it's only going to pick one. So as long as you're not in a scenario like that, uh, you can use multiple versions as you, as you wish. Uh, or if you describe them by the next path, then you can always use them regardless. So. Okay, 
Thank you, John. Um, another question over on Matrix. Um, A. Kenji asked, what is the major feature that Hydra has that other CI CDs don't support? Uh, right now, what I would say is multi-platform and then also the ability to evaluate some Nix code to then determine later on what you need. So uh, for example, uh, if we want to update Nixos on stable, uh, what happens is that every six hours, Hydra is going to go pull the master branch and it's going to run um, uh, Nixos uh, release.nix. And then in there, just evaluating that logic will then kind of expand out to all of the packages that are free uh, for every platform. And then Hydra then is able to then kind of distribute that amongst the build machines. And I think, yeah. So I would say that's the main thing is that Hydra is Nix aware and then you can leverage Nix to then do workflows. Okay, cool. Um, then Mighty I am again. Um, why are those occasions, sorry. Why are there occasionally failures on Hydra and how can those be eliminated or reduced? Uh, yeah, so I would say that the the bane of most builds right now is the staging workflow. Uh, so Nix has this dual edged sword of being aware of everything that it needs, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's great when everything is already built and it's fantastic. But let's say if you're like, oh, I want to update uh, the version of glibc. Well, pretty much everything has an opinion about what version of glibc they're using. So if you do modify that, then you're rebuilding the world essentially. And that that is a very computationally expensive task. Uh, hopefully with CA derivations, that gets taped heavily or bandited heavily. Um, but in its current form, uh, to rebuild the world is very long, and we don't expect anyone to do that on their personal machines. So we have a staging next workflow where you get all these risky updates all compiled together. And what happens is that we just kind of do a pri prioritization of, well, this package breaks 100, uh, or like 100 of these packages break, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to fix those and prioritize those. But we get this long tail of one or two packages causing a few failures. And that's that's where we get most of the accumulated like build failures is that um, generally there are these packages that the upstream isn't super active about adopting new dependencies. Mm -hmm. And then next packages is in this weird state of the assumptions about what it needed has changed without the manpower to actually solve it. And so this is, how we remedy this on the, the Nix package side is that uh, twice a year, we do something called zero hydro failures in anticipation of a release. And so then we will generally have the community take like a, a good effort in going through that backlog and um, going through that backlog and uh, remedying all those, those build failures. Okay. Then, um... Colin Arnett, also on Matrix, asks, how will you improve the experience of Python developers working with ML slash data science libraries in Nix? Example, I have read your I have read your experience on on NX runtime. I have no idea what that is, to be honest. It's uh yeah, Onyx runtime. Uh, so Onyx is a uh, machine learning neural net framework that's mm -hmm done by Microsoft and a few other other partners. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, I, I think it, I think it's just a few things. Um, like Python is uniquely painful. Uh, I'm just going to use that word because the Python packages need to be coherent. So I mentioned earlier, uh, like you can have multiple versions of things. Python is one of those exceptions where the Python interpreter, if you do import NumPy, it can, it can only import the first NumPy that it encounters. And so then that's one thing you need to force a coherent environment. This is also why if you try to do different versions on a PR, we're gonna we're gonna yell at you. We don't we don't mean to hate on you. It's just the Python that that complexity percolates up to us. Um, and then uh, another thing too is machine learning. One thing that uh, Nix packages Nix packages is not great for is that we try to satisfy all. Um, extensions to architecture, uh, ISAs. So what I mean by that is that we can't do stuff like AV, AVX256. Uh, that's just not allowed with Linux packages because it's going to limit the amount of hardware that can actually run that software. So um, that's another kind of thing against it. Um, and then lastly, 
for Onyx runtime in particular, it's just that the upstream and not not to not to hate on Microsoft because a lot of those people are working hard, but they do like a lot of un un uh, un idiomatic practices in regards to Git, CMake, and a few other things where it makes it really painful to actually maintain that. Um, and what I mean by that is that their CMake workflow is essentially like Git module based, and it doesn't try to do any type of fine package thing so that it works well with different ecosystems. Uh, and then also, I just remember the last time I tried to do it, uh, the base checkout was one gig because it had a bunch of example neural nets in it. Mm -hmm. So it was just, I was just like, uh, OK, um, I don't feel like maintaining this. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a pain. <laughs> OK, um, so if my tabs were to switch, there we go. Um, Paul Henry over on the Oncast instance is asking, when defining a NixOS module, how far should we go with the explicitness of the configuration? For instance, um, what is the goal between just a plain text config or full explicit typed config like matrix synapse module? Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, one, one isn't necessarily better than the other. So going the fully typed route, it, it is a nice user experience because then if you do man configuration.nix, you'll just see everything explicitly. Uh, but for example, uh, I recently tried to package Spire, which is like this um, identity type of service framework so that like if you're in an organization, you can uniquely kind of provision and uh, do like ACLs on different machines uh, and workloads. Uh, the thing though is that like they have a very dynamic configuration there, and and I really wanted to just say like, hey, please use the H uh, HCL and then just delegate to that. Um, but there's not a good way to do. Okay, Spire was probably a bad example because they use HCL. Uh, but like in a lot of workflows, uh, like Nix, for example, uh, we went over to just having a settings, and uh, that that's untyped, but. Uh, as long as you can reference the documentation where that gets consumed, I think that's actually a better workflow because that's closer to what upstream has. So we don't have to do this like Nix specific translation layer where that can be like updated out of sync. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the, the foot gun for doing a specific typed module configuration is that you're, you're very, very specific to what it is at that current state. Uh, and then you're unable to kind of change with time. Um, yeah. So um, I see that Matthias has another question on Matrix, so I'll leave it over to him again. Yeah, I have one more question, uh, John. Um, do you know what resources you need to actually run something like Nix packages? Uh, so the, how many build servers and um, you know storage and so on? Do, do you know that? Or oh, you're talking about like the official Nix sense? instance uh, and it, yeah to run nix packages um, so. oh to actually run nix packages so right now uh we as in not me because i'm not maintaining this at all but graham and other people um yeah i think the s3 bucket last time i checked was like 220 terabytes like a year and a half ago um and so then it's probably getting close to 300 terabytes for all of the packages right now it's just kind of like an append only s3 cache um and then in front of that we have Fastly CDN, and so then that's why you get relatively great um, download speeds. And uh, the other thing about the build server, you would probably have to ask Graham. Right now, we have a very generous donation through Equinix, um, and they supply a lot of build compute. And I think the only thing that's in our domain is the M1 uh, Mac machines. Everything else, though, I think I want to say is donated. But don't quote me on that. Uh, Graham would be a better one to ask. Uh, yeah, so I, I I don't think it's as much as people think it is, mostly just because we have so much donations. Um, and thank you to everyone who donates to Nexus Foundation uh, to support the lights and being on. OK, great. Um, so over Matrix, uh, you guys are killing me with these names because I have a really difficult time pronouncing some of them. Um, Fufixcon. Fufexcon, just correct me if I'm butchering that. I'm t terribly sorry. Um, is there anything you'd change if you were to start Nix packages again? 
Oh, I don't know. Um, I think the main thing with Nick's package is that it's grown so organically over time that a lot of those decisions that we made later that were painful weren't apparent that they needed to be made until we had to incur the pain of them initially. So um, I don't know. I kind of, part of me just kind of really likes the chaos with the Nick's packages where it's not so like rigidly defined that we have to do X forever. And it's kind of just like, as long as you get enough, um, people on board with something if it's like next packages wide maybe you need to do rfc but essentially it's like as long as you're able to put in the effort you can kind of change next packages as you want as long as other people also agree that's the right path forward um and so then to answer would i do anything different um no because uh i i think it's just like kind of growing like you can think of it as like a child growing into like adult like next packages is like this organic body of code and it's kind of just nice to see it grow over time. Um. Um, then STEM over at Matrix again is asking in the current form, how hospital hospitable do you feel next packages would be to localization? Oh, you're talking about like different languages. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not a good person to answer this because I'm my first language and pretty much only language is English. And so then that's just the world that I know. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I think what we would want to try to avoid though is make it burdensome to do future contributions. As long as it's kind of just like able to be done in addition to what we currently do, I think that's fine. Um, but I, I would like to avoid a situation where now it's like to contribute, you also need to provide localization or something like that. But um, I wouldn't even know how that would fit in just because Nix, like it's another parameter that would need to go into evaluation to determine whether or not it should or shouldn't. I don't know. Um, I can't speak in, I, I can't give a good answer on this. I uh, apologize. That's fine. Um, I'm looking if I see any more questions coming in. Uh, uh, well, one last thing I want to say though is that like, sure, I don't time. have, uh, I would really like to see localization. I know that for a lot of people, if they're understanding something, like having it in their native language allows them to comprehend it a lot better. And so then I think localization is still really important. I just don't know how to do it in a good way. <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense. I also would have no clue on how to even begin on that. Uh, yeah, I'm looking, but I don't see any other questions coming in. Do you perhaps have any questions left, Matthias? Uh, I'm good. Sorry, just had to find the StreamYard tab again. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know the struggle right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, um, there's one more person typing in Matrix, so I'm going to wait for that to either disappear or come in. And after that, we'll wrap up if that's OK. Uh, sure, sounds good. So I'll give it a little bit. So Magic RB over on the own cast is asking, how is was your day? Oh, uh, I just woke up. So <laughs> it's not the beginning. Um, but relatively good. Thank you for asking. Um, I, guess, I guess while we're waiting on that, uh, one thing that I would just like to iterate is that like, uh, Next packages is the culmination of many, 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 many people contributing to it over time, um, and that uh, we are very welcome uh, to having new people come in. And uh, if you do want to contribute to Next packages, don't feel like you're unable to do so. Uh, it is generally I've never seen anyone kind of be pushed away just because they didn't know. It's more or less if they do. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we, we we have an open door type policy, and we're very welcome to to new contributions. So, cool. I think um, there's also an interesting comment from uh, Silvan, uh, who said that this there's a Nix packages architecture team uh, now to discuss the architecture of Nix packages, and there's a matrix channel uh, to join that. Maybe I don't know if um, we can post a link here. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent um, comment. Uh, like I said earlier, Next Packages is a very organic community and code base, and that yeah. So the architecture team is a relatively new addition, but um, yeah, 
that's the other thing too, is that if, if you have your ear to the ground in Next Packages community, there's likely to be something that you're very interested in to come along at a, a particular time. Okay, cool. Um, there are people asking to review their PR in the matrix. <laughs> um, I would say um, try posting your pull request in some of the next channels or even the, the lecture series channels and perhaps it'll get, it'll get some attention that way. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's there's PRs ready to view on this course uh, thread, and then on the unofficial uh, Discord, there's also a thread there. Um, but the main thing though is that if you do post a PR, uh, I would say try to do that in kind, so review someone else's PR. And if we do kind of have that like nice, if you contribute a PR, but then you also help remove a PR, then the status quo will be a lot easier to maintain. Yes. I think that would be it. Um, I didn't see any other questions pop up on any of the other platforms. So um, thank you very much again, John, for giving your talk. Uh, I know that I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, yeah, I'm guessing we'll see you hanging around in the community um, in certain places. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll think I'll be wrapping up then. OK. Uh, my, my little uh, exit will just be that I really would really like to thank everyone who was involved with making this happen. Uh, I know that organizing, planning, setting up things, all the infrastructure, planning, scheduling, uh, it's a lot of time to do that. And uh, I know for myself when I was early on in my next um, adventure, and I was desperate for like more next videos, content, everything. So I think it's really good that we kind of publish more. And I think this is really good for the community. So. Thank you, everyone who contributes to Nix on a daily basis. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Yes. Thank you, John. I will be closing now. So I will be removing you guys from the stage. <laughs> so yes, thank you, everybody, for joining once again. Um, again, if you have more questions for John or anyone else from the community, head over to the Matrix. Uh, the link is on screen right now. And we can have a continued discussion over there. Once again, Thanks to everybody that made this happen. And I do hope to see you all next time. Keep an eye out on Discourse for the next announcement uh, when the next lecture series will be. So see you then.